spoken before, but all of a sudden I heard a voice come into my spirit. I believe and I know. That's the message for the next season. So here is my moment where I want to have an anchor. Revisit my life for what God has planned for the future. So as much as this message will come across to you as a message of, you know, intimacy to your heart, I believe it's also a message for me to make my structure put together again for the next season that God has. So it's for both of us, the speaker and the listener, are going to benefit out of it. Are you ready? I've spoken much, but I had to bring this landing in order for the next takeoff. So this is a moment. God has done something extraordinary. On Wednesday, you'll hear about it. Mighty. You know, where God can turn. It's like a place like North Korea suddenly turned around. If God can do that. And I've been able to witness such a powerful move. But now I'm back. In the church with my people. The little home that I have. No big news media. Nothing. Back to normal. Back to where I get to see my people and say, I love you, hug. That's all. No media is now watching. But from here, where is God taking us? And do you want to be part of it? And today, we'll journey together. What next? What is the key that God is in asking us to hold on to? Because what God does, you can't manufacture. Don't even think about manufacturing. Because I didn't even know what was happening last week. It happened about a few months back. But God has a way of doing things that will surprise you. Can I declare today, we are going to see big things happen overnight. Because our God is a God of action. He's alive. So with that being said, let's come together to the word for this afternoon. A small message that will give us some instruction for the future. Am I sounding too somber? Or is it, are you looking more serious? Come on, church. Give me one smile that says, Pastor, we love you. You know, it's okay. You are born in 1921. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Dale has been such a good spot traveling, such a joy. And by the way, what he said is true. You travel, you travel, and once you hit Canada, that's when you feel tired. You feel more tired the last leg of the journey for us from Montreal, Toronto, to Edmonton. Then you even experience coming from another continent. You know, please pray for our airports and our planes. Believe me, when you compare it to other airports and planes across the world, we are really bad. I'm telling you, really bad. You know, business class seats don't look business anymore. You know, it's more trouble for me because at least if I was traveling economy, I can land my feet on the floor. This time, my feet is hanging in the air. It can't touch the floor, neither it reclines. Pastor Dale has no problem. <laughs> he doesn't know what I'm talking about. So it starts to swell and all that. But, you know, I'm thankful. I think I am made the perfect travel size. Perfect. Amen. So, thank you for all your prayers. Let's go to what God wants. I'm listening as much as I'm speaking today. Let's go to how God wants to anchor us for the next season. I want you to come with me to the book of Acts. Chapter number 5. Verse number 17. Acts 5, 17. And the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is a party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple. And speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak. 
and began to teach. Let me pause there for a moment. The first truth that I want to bring before you, the word is a word that hinges upon an event that took place before or a season of things that happened or season in which things happened. And what was that season? How does it look like? Before this arrest happened, what was the season? The season was this, verse number 16 or 15 onwards. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. That as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. This word, all healed, is only found in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But here is the apostles in a place, in a season where extraordinary things are happening and it's affecting everybody that's coming in contact with them. People are coming from, not just from Jerusalem, from other cities as well. Unclean spirits are leaving people. Signs and wonders are taking place like nobody's business. The shadow of Peter is healing people, which has never happened even in the time of Jesus. At least we have no record of it. Such unprecedented things are happening, but the next two words is key. The key is they got agitated. The Sadducees, who are they? They are the ones that didn't believe in the supernatural. Even if supernatural were to stare in their face, they had a way of circumventing what they are seeing right in front of their eyes. They couldn't believe it. So they got agitated and they decided to arrest the apostles and put them in prison. The first truth I want you to understand, sometimes when supernatural move happen, the enemy has a way of creating a sense of agitation. That means the enemy has been affected. I want everybody to know spiritual battle is not just one way. It happens in two directions. The new attack the powers of darkness the enemy also has a way of attacking you back. And that's the reason people love to have a territory and a comfort zone where they don't open up to spiritual things. So once they open up, what if there is going to be, a, a, what do you call, a retribution from the enemy against you? But I want you to know this. This is a possibility. After the greatest move of God, here comes the prison. But what was so powerful for me, what God spoke to my heart, are these things. Listen to this. You know, the Bible says they were put into the prison, the public place. The King James Version says they were put into a common prison. Why is that word so important? You know, a prison in those days has got a way of affecting your physical condition. You know, I know this from coming from Eastern land where prison is known or jails and prison is known for beating up people and making it so bad. Recently, I was listening to a video. You know, there was a couple arrested last week from the northern state of Uttar Pradesh in India for just having a meeting, Christian meeting in their home. In fact, they come from my place of birth, you know, but they were ministering in northern part of it. They didn't even share the gospel with anybody. They were having just small meeting and the the people who hated Christians just hindered that, you know, beat them up. They're taken to the police station. But what happens to the police station is even more gruesome. You know, this is what was reported based on many, many, you know, informations that we are getting. They cannot pursue this on a legal basis because India, even today, has got a constitution. So the case continues for years. And finally, after eight, 10 years, you might get a reprisal. You might be sent off because there's nothing against in you practicing your faith according to a constitution, even today. So what they do in order to bring that certain sense of intimidation, they are beaten up so badly, so badly, vital organs get affected. The beating is on vital organs. This is a husband and a wife serving the Lord. And, and recently, a pastor was taken in, beaten up so badly, he could not even survive for one year. 
That's how bad the beating are. So this is how they put fear on others who would want to share the gospel. But let me tell you, people of God, we are beginning to see that my God is still on the throne. That's so beautiful. So this is the major reason why they put people into prison. They hurt them, beat them up, and causes that sense of you know, fear that others can learn to respect. But I want you to know this. In this case, that is not just the case. They put them into a common prison. You know, where common criminals are put. Why is that? There's also a mental attack, an attack on a psyche. What do they want to communicate by putting you in the common prison? On your left, you have got robbers and thieves and, 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 and rapists and murderers and all kinds of people. And you're made to fit into that community or that place. Why is that so? Just to make you feel, after the mighty move of God, you are just common. There's nothing special about you. They want to create this sense that you're just a, like you're treated like a criminal. After seeing one of the most powerful moves of God, after seeing miracles happen, supernatural things happen, you've been pushed to a place where you're treated just like a criminal. A criminal who's not done what others have done. But the treatment, nevertheless, is the same. You know, I know what I'm talking about. It's a sense of you are nothing. You don't even feel any more joy in what God did through you. You don't even feel excitement in what God did through you. You don't feel that sense of, you know, that there was something special that was happening because the treatment is made so that you will not feel special anymore. You have been pushed to the place where you are let, like the robber and the thief who is sitting beside you. But let me tell you, when the enemy wants to make you feel that you are just like anybody else or commoner, like a thief, treated like Mr. Nobody. I want you to know there's a beautiful passage. The angel of the Lord came and he took them out. When others want to make you feel that you're not special, God has a way of sending an angel to show that you're special. He has a way of telling you that you are special. You are his people. You know what, what I love about that angelic visitation? The angel opened doors, opened doors. It was not just one door. He opened many doors. He came in. He did not remove everybody from the prison. He chose only the apostles, and said, you guys come out. Let me tell you, when the enemy wants you to feel that you are nothing, God has a way of doing something in your life that shows favor. Come on, hallelujah. Favor. Come on. You know, I want people of God to expect in this season, a season of favor, meaning that you will be treated different to others. Your physical body will be treated differently. Your situation will be treated differently. Your finance will be treated differently. It's not like anything happens to everybody. Let me tell you, God has a way of telling you that in spite of you being pushed to a place of commonality, I'm going to show the way things are going to happen to you will be different, different, different. Can somebody shout a hallelujah in the house? I'm going to treat you different. Come on. Can I get somebody to believe this? The enemy has made you feel, in spite of what God has done in your life, in spite of your prayer, that you are not different to anybody. But here I want to make it clear. Maybe your situation might not be different to anybody, but the outcome is going to be different. Oh, you didn't hear that. Can I make a statement once again? Because you belong to God, because God has a plan over your life, the outcome of your life will not be what happened to your neighbor. It will be different. If you believe that, can you put your hands together, give the Lord a praise. 
You go through the same fire like somebody else, but you come out even without the smell of fire. You go through lions then like somebody else, but you come out and the lions become your pet. Come on, hallelujah. You go through crisis like nobody else, somebody else, but when you come out, you come out more victorious than others. Oh, you didn't hear me. You go through a situation, a financial crisis, as like somebody else, but the outcome is you come out with more favor. Church, I want you to know the devil wanted you to feel insignificant and rejected to the point of you're not like, you're not special. I want you to put you in the common prison like anybody else. But the angel of the Lord came to show that when I do a miracle, I will treat you different. So can I hear somebody who is going through a situation like anybody else, but believes the outcome will be very unique, very different, very special, because your God is your heavenly Father. If you believe that, come on. It's as if God is dealing with you by a different standard. It's as if you have got a different law governing your life. It's like everybody has got one particular system of things happening for them, and, but you are in a different system altogether because you are special. That's the word grace. That's the word favor. You'll go through the same crisis like anybody else, but when the angel comes, you are walking out. Others are sitting back. Come on, hallelujah. The enemy's plan to make you feel that you're not special is broken today. God calls you special. God calls you the apple of his eye. God calls you his beloved daughter and beloved son. If you believe that you are special to him, can you make a sound of joy in the house of a Lord? You are. Come on, church. Now, let me ask you, let me try to to fit in a certain sense of this is something that we all know. After much prayer, much glory, you go back and see the same situation, go through the same situation, and you feel there's nothing special about your relationship with God. But let me tell you, people of God, he looks down and looks at you and say, you are my beloved. There's something called common grace. Common grace means God sends a rain upon the wicked and the righteous. He sends, you know, the snow upon the righteous and the wicked. There's no difference, no difference. The same rain, but there's something called uh, not 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 general grace, but there's something called special grace, meaning God deals with you differently than with somebody else. Because God says, it's not a regular law on you. I'm going to treat you different. You will come out not losing things in your life, but gaining more things. If you believe that, can you put your hands together? Give a Lord a praise in the house of a Lord. It's an attack on your brain and your mind. You don't feel any special. After having some of the most powerful move of God where I have to literally hide myself, then become visible. You know, walking in the airport where you have to almost drag your legs was not something that makes you feel special. But I'm here to say, when you go through that, you're not going to be surviving on the general grace of God that everybody else gets. There's a special grace. All things work together for good for those who are called by. In your case, things are going to become good. It's going to be better. Can I get somebody who can say, hey, I'm going through the situation like the rest of the people, but my outcome is different because I serve a God who loves me, who shows favor upon me, whose grace is upon me. Only such people can you give a Lord a praise in the house. Hey! Hallelujah. You know, I was thinking today, the word flooded my heart today, and the word is cargo. Cargo. I don't know why that word was coming over and over again. And the Lord started to speak to me, just the close 
it's closer time to come to the church, closer to the time coming to church, I started hearing it. He said, do you know the story of Paul in the ship? And finally, everything that they thought was precious, cargo, had to be thrown overboard. Because at the end of the day, God is now leveling the field. You started the journey all together. You know, Paul with the other prisoners, everybody looks the same, everybody has the same status. But when God intervened, they said, throw all the precious cargo out. The only cargo that's going to protect this ship is a man sitting there. He's a precious cargo. The ship's destiny is based on him. The future of over 200 of you know, prisoners depends on him. Everything depends on this one cargo. Let me tell you, there'll come a point where God will show that precious are his people. It's not money. It's about servant of God. It's about a child of God. I hope you understand. Cargos were thrown. Cargos once was, you know, looked at as important, precious. Will come to a point they don't have any more value. The only valuable cargo is one that can protect the ship. One that can say, my God spoke to me. Let me tell you, people of God, when some of you are going to become the precious cargo that people are willing to trade for gold and silver. They're going to say, even if you lose everything, I want a word from that man of God. Can I get somebody who believes God is going to make you somebody who can affect a family, affect people, affect your children, affect people connected to you? Because in the sight of God, you are the cargo. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house of the Lord? Can no, if you believe that your anointing makes you special, can you make a sound in the house of a Lord? Kings are going to recognize it. People are going to realize it. You are the cargo. <laughs> Nothing matters at that time. It's all about Paul. It's like, you know, Paul becomes the most precious cargo on that ship. The pilot is not no more important than Paul. Nothing is more important. This man is the one who's more important. How did it start? It started as him being a commoner among the prisoner. But very soon, God amplifies his worth as a child of God, as a servant of God. It's like the ocean is conspiring for sake of Paul. It's like the ship movement is all about for sake of Paul. It's like the, what is happening inside the ship, even the conversations, even the stupidity of people is connected to this one man. You started as a commoner, but God has a way of highlighting your importance. I'm here to say, if you are a child of God, do not lose hope. God will make you the precious cargo for sake of your family, for the sake of people connected to you. Can I see some precious cargo? Not because you've got more gold or silver. That will be thrown overboard. What, what makes you special that you are purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that you belong to him. Can, Oh, you, you didn't hear me. Can I see some precious cargoes here? Washed by the blood of Jesus who has the Holy Spirit inside them. Can you make a sound in the house of the Lord? People are going to listen to you. You will become. Come on, church. Can I get... Can I get somebody in the house? Or don't get me wrong. The most precious cargo of Canada is not Trudeau. The most precious cargo of Canada is a church that believes on the Lord. Come on, call for the purposes of God. Can I hear a sound of amen in the house? Come on, church. More than politicians, more than leaders, more than the captain of the ship. It's about this one man who was treated like nobody when the journey commenced. 
Hang in there. Hang in there. The God of Joseph. Before you know you're promoted. Before you know you're advising. Before you know the key is in your hand. Hang in there. You're a precious commodity. Can I see somebody today, in spite of what you're going through, do you believe that you're precious to your heavenly father? You're washed by the blood. Purchased by Jesus. Jesus paid the price for you because you're precious in his sight. If you believe that's who you are, can I see some precious cargo sitting in some sinking ships and because of you, God is going to protect people around you. Can I hear somebody who can make a shot? Come on, you. Come on. You can do better. You can do better if you believe the destiny of a nation, destiny of families are connected to you. Can you give a Lord a praise in the house of the Lord? The devil wants you to know that you are just nobody and you will die like anybody. But God says, he who started a good work in you, he knows how to complete it. You are precious in his sight. Oh, come on. Oh, I can feel the anointing when I said that. Because a battle happening right now. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'll be the first person to lift up my hand for sake of, you know, a sense of, uh, 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 what's the word? A sense of, you know, we are in the same camp. I will raise my hand. But is anybody who wants to join me today? After having some beautiful encounters with the Lord, the enemy wants you to feel that there's nothing special, unique about you. And makes you feel like, the rest of the people around you. But today, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I want some of you to shake off that false identity that the devil wants to enforce on you and take the identity that you are in Christ more than a conqueror. You are special to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can somebody make an action where you're going to shake Shake off that false identity and say you're special to God. Angels know you're special. God knows you're special. The captain of the ship will know you are special. The ocean knows you're special. Can somebody shout a hallelujah in the house? Oh, come on. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, church, you don't need much more preaching. All you need is a faith that will defy the demonic powers that's trying to pull you down into a place of de depression and disappointment. Can you shake yourself up with a shout of praise and say, I might have started as ordinary, but I will not end ordinary. I am special to my God. If you believe that, make a sound. Hey, hallelujah. Somebody shout a hallelujah. Everything about you is special. The enemy wanted me to sink, not into the depth of an ocean, but the depth of depression. But today... I stand here as a servant of a living God representing my church and the people that I'm taking with me to a throne of grace. And I say it today, you know, it might have looked that we all are in the same boat, pun intended. But today when the journey ends, we will know for sure somebody gets highlighted. It's not because he's special in his own rights. It's because his God is special. His calling is special. Come on. His salvation is special. His restoration is special. His miracle is special. If I can see somebody who knows what I'm talking about, can you make a sound in the house of the Lord? You are a special cargo. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. The devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. 
I'm seeing a vision as I'm speaking this. The angel of the Lord is opening many doors, but he's not releasing everybody. He's opening doors to bring the apostles only out. Come on, because they are the special cargo sitting in the prison. He wants to bring them out and say, even though the enemy wanted you to feel after a mighty ministry that you are nobody and insignificant, irrelevant, but today I want you to make... I want you to make this realization in your heart, even in that place of being put together with a general crowd. You are not general. You are not common. Your calling is different. Your anointing is different. And God is about to make that shown outside. Can I get somebody who believes you are different because God, your God, is the only living God. Church, you don't need my prayer to get a miracle if you believe that your God will work with you differently than anybody else because you are chosen people, a royal priesthood. If you believe that, can you make some sound in the house of a Lord with a... When I heard today that people of the highest you know, profile in India, seeking out what made us special. They are requesting us to repeat what happened in this election across India. What made us special? We have nothing special, but we serve a God who is not like any other God. Our God is special. And that's the reason Paul says, the God whom I serve has told me that nothing, no soul will perish on this ship. From that moment and onwards, everybody wants Paul's advice. Even the captain and the pilot wants to hear from Paul. Started as a common prisoner, ends as a man giving instruction. Can you say, when God is on my side, I'm not going down and under. He's taking me from glory to glory. If you believe that, can I? (laughs) Now, let me say this. So, from common prisoners, now I've made to look different. Supernatural things are happening. Angels are coming only for your sake. So Paul and so the apostles come out. But why did God make them special? Now listen to this. Very key. When you expect, or when, I'm sorry, when you start to see that God is treating you different. Now can I make a statement? Don't get me wrong. Some of you seated here are not supposed to be sitting here. You should have been either in a hospital or dead. Or on the streets, hopeless, drunk to the core to avoid taking or avoid looking at the reality of your life. But God delivered you in a way that makes you feel you are special to him. You are special to him. He delivered you to make you feel. You could have been gone by enough. In all the areas that I spoke, not just physical death, but also emotionally, and in a way that your life becomes hopeless. But he reached out for you and said, because I live, you shall live also. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house? 
Come on, church. If anybody knows that you are seated here, able to say hallelujah because God gave you a second chance. God opened the doors for you and brought you out. Can you make a sound of joy in the house of the Lord? Hey! Hey, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's my story. I'm alive for a reason. Brought, me, brought them out. And let me tell you, I've got one instruction for people. When God does an extraordinary things in your life that others are not privy to experience, don't ever think that it comes with a sense of it's all about you. Many a times we have got a way of pocketing what God did and then don't understand the message of why he did it. There's always a message behind his miracle. You can't just pocket the miracle and not be responsive to the message. The apostles just had the biggest miracle. They could have been dead in a few hours. But why? Every one of you have experienced a life-changing experience in your life. You should ask the question, why? So the angel comes and he didn't have a time of, you know, be thankful and get excited about what happened to you guys. The prison door is still, you know, you know what? The key, the, the lock, the door, everything was still closed. But they walked out. Now it is like walking through the walls. This is the resurrection. This happened with Jesus. Jesus. It's happening again. They literally walk through a wall without an opening. That's not easy. That's not small. That's impossible. But why? The angel did not waste any time. The same angel that delivered this apostles had a very stern warning. Three words. Go, stand, and speak. Go, stand, and speak. You were given an extension of life and dealt with in a unique manner as opposed to others for these words to become the words of your life. Go, speak, stand. Go speak where? Now don't get me wrong. I have to be a little insensitive to a cultural system of human excellence, I should call it, even among Christians. Smartness, I should call it. Once God does something, then it's not up to you to run your life. What did the angel say? You know, where, where do you think that as apostles are going to face the biggest problem? In Jerusalem. But what did the angel say? Go and speak in the temple. That's the last place you want to go to. Because suddenly a man was seen, experienced life, will go to any extent to preserve it. You don't want to go to, you will try to do the ministry, but not in Jerusalem anymore. But not in the temple anymore. You want to avoid that temple that started all this problem. But here I'm talking to another generation that's going to rise up. Who will say, to begin with, my life came from him. It's not that I protected my life. 
He gave it to me. And as long as I know that truth, I'm here to declare even the preservation of my life belongs to him. I don't preserve my life. I just give it to the one who gave it to me. Can I get a witness here? If you didn't hear that. God is asking them to do something which is going to put their life back in jeopardy. You know, it doesn't sound like an excellent thought or a smart idea. Because you now escape from the, from the fangs and the teeth of, of death. And all of a sudden, God is asking you to go back in the straight, back into the crocodile's mouth. From out of which you barely escaped. But today the word is, go, stand, and speak. In this house, can I see an army that will rise up and say, more than my life, I honor God's word. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house? No, you didn't hear that. He's there a choice that will stand up and say, more than my life, my God comes first. His word comes first. Can you shout hallelujah in the house? You don't preserve your life. He does it for you. Can I get somebody who believes I'm alive today because of him? And I will be alive because of his purpose. If you believe that, can you shout hallelujah in the house? God showed exception in your life for the sake of a divine purpose. Your life is about his purpose. Oh, I want to be there. I don't want to lose the message in the midst of the miracle. Go. Speak. You know, the word there is go. Take a stand and speak. The word take a stand is more about a positioning, a determination. Take a stand. You cannot be having a bent flow. You cannot be wobbly. You have to take a stand. Today, let me ask you, if God has given you a life, a miracle in your life, can you take a stand today? You may not be asked to preach today, but... I'm asking you to take a stand today. What is the stand that you're going to take? You're going to take a stand today. More than anything else, God comes first in my life. More than anything else, I want to please him. Can I get somebody who can... On the count of three, can I see somebody who's willing to take a stand for Jesus? One, two, and three. Can you shout? Take a stand for Jesus. Take a stand for Jesus. Let me put this straight. When God gives exceptional miracles in your life, it's not to start a prayer party inside the cell. It's not to have a worship night. I'm not against it. It's not to have a moment where you go on YouTube and listen to some music. God said, go. Apostles rallying around miracle is not the moment that God has called you for. It's not the moment where you come together to have a church. It's time to go. It's time to go to the worst situation and say, I will obey and honor God. Can I get somebody who want to find taking a stand, not just within the comfort of your church where people are singing and there's music, but to take a stand in the midst of hostility and say, I represent my God. Can I hear a shout in the house today? Go, take a stand. Where? In the temple where people are planning to kill you. Take a stand. Go. Take a stand and speak. But I want everybody in this place 
who wants to take a stand for Jesus. Because your life, you know why I'm making this as a message that seems to be, recently I preached a message called The Last Words of an Anointed One. I'm preaching as if every message is a last message. If God has given you life, and that too in a special way, it's not for you to have a meritorious assembly of, look how special I am. It's about to say, I have nothing to boast. It was His grace. Now, Lord, you have given me a life. Let me live for you. Only such people want to take a stand for the purpose of the kingdom of God. Let me hear as if I'm hearing the sound of a thousand members in the church who are rising up in unison with a sense of a certain sense of distinctive determination and saying, God, if you have given me a life, that life is for you. I'm taking a position for the sake of the kingdom of God. Only such people make a sound in the house of the Lord right now. Oh, for you! Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. But for those of you who made that commitment, let me lessen the burden of, of, of your responsibility by saying a word of encouragement. The first time you see the word histomy, take a stand, is in the book of Acts 2, when Peter stood up with the rest of the leaven. That's the word. He was taking a stand with the rest of the leaven. But how many of you know when that happened, Peter was considered a man who was so feeble. He was always flickering in his decisions. Now he's taking a stand like rock solid. And with the leaven of the apostles, he's standing up. That means the church was standing in unison. Till then, they'd never stood together. If Peter stood, John would run away from Peter. But now they're standing together. But why did that happen? Who made that possible? The Bible says a fire came upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. The first time they stood up to make a stand as apostles, it was a fire of the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to say, if it is the Holy Spirit that made you stand, no matter what, he will make you stand again. He will give you the strength. If you believe I don't stand on my strength, on my determination, on my commitment, on my ability to believe myself, but I stand on the power of the living God, on the power of the Holy Ghost, who will make me stand for Jesus. Only such people can you give a Lord a praise. Let the devil know you are standing on the power of God. Hallelujah. Let me wrap it up here. Speak. Speak. Now let me ask you something. Are you or will you be happy if I tell you that you will be given the responsibility of giving out to people something that no powers of the world, no money, can ever give to anybody. Will you be happy to know that you are a, 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 what do you call a businessman or a tradesman who's carrying the most precious commodity on this planet that nobody, no kings, no rulers can give? If you know at least that, will that make it easier for you to stand for Jesus? And what is the commodity that you're carrying? You're carrying words of life. Can somebody today declare, oh, I can sense, you know, God has been speaking about this church touching touching the world, a mission church. But now I sense something has been released in that direction. God says, I'm releasing you. Go and you will speak the words of life to people who are dead, to countries that need that word of life. If you believe only Jesus can give words of life, can you make a sound in the house? 
Come on, Pastor. That's the reason we go. Because only Jesus has the words of life. Can somebody believe? Buddha doesn't have it. Muhammad doesn't have it. No kings or gods have it. Only Jesus has the words of life. Can you shout hallelujah? So we go. I feel like preaching. Benel, your mail the other day touched my heart. But go again. Go again. Because you have something that nobody else has. The words of life. I wouldn't be going to India. I wouldn't be going to Africa. I wouldn't be going to, 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 to any place if these words did not contain life. But I'm here to say the only word that can bring life is the word of Jesus. And with that, go. Go. Church, I'm declaring here, go. Go to your neighbors. Go to your family. Because when you open your mouth to speak these words, these are the words of life. It can bring life to any situation. If you want to be a missionary for Jesus, a minister of the gospel, can you make a sound in the house of the Lord? Go! Hey! In the days to come, I thank God for Pastor Dale for traveling with me. Pastor, you will have your seniority. But there will be others also joining the crew. Hey, hallelujah. I'm looking at some of you. Get ready. And when you go, you're not going empty. You're going with the words of life. Are you ready? Speak about this word and be confident. You know, I want to close here in five minutes. I just want to say this. this is not mine. I, I, I know most of the charismatic preachers, I think, at least would have preached 50, 60 sermons repeated on John 10.10. 10. The devil comes to steal, destroy, and to... What is that? To kill. But I came to give life and life in number. And, and I thought, when is the last time I preached? Maybe in years I have not preached that. In years. Because it has been used so many times. But today, I was able to go to a commentary, word to word, in Greek. Rick Renner has written a beautiful article on it. All he did was, I don't like people's commentary, but this man went to the Greek. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life that they might have it abundantly. Can I read this? According to these words of Jesus, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy everything good in your life. He wants to destroy your job, your joy, your happiness, your health, your finance, your marriage, your kids. The thief just wants to ruin everything he can get his hands on. The word thief comes from the Greek word klepto. Klepto which means a steal, it gives a picture of a bandit, a pickpocket, or thief who is so artful in the way he steals that his exploits of thievery are nearly undetectable. A good pickpocket can take things out of your purse and you will not even know that he was around you. This reminds me of the pickpockets who walk the streets in certain areas of Moscow. By the way, I had a very bad experience in France. Within a few seconds, I lost my wallet. Smart thief. And went to the police station. And the police, I thought he was more desperate. He didn't have an answer for what was happening. Because now it's an organized crime in France. They'll, be, they'll take what they want long gone before that person discovers they were even there. Jesus used this word let us, to let us know the devil is very cunning in the way he steals from people. He knows that if he does it outright, his action will be recognized. Therefore, he steals from people in such a deceptive way. That he often accomplishes his evil goal before they even know he has stolen from them. Often the devil injects thoughts into a person's mind to steal his peace. Now this is clip two. What is so interesting is the next word. But Jesus said he also comes to kill. And I didn't know this. At first glance it appears that this means to kill as to take someone's life. But the Greek word is 
Kristuyo, which means to sacrifice. It originally referred to sacrificial giving of animals on the altar. It could mean to sacrifice, to surrender, to give up something that is precious and dear. It was particularly used in a religious connotation to denote the sacrifice of animals. And it had nothing to do with killing in terms of murder. I thought the devil comes and kills. No, 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 that's not what he does. He will make us, convince us that we have to sacrifice something, we have to give up. In order to just be normal. It will make us believe that we have to give up things slowly. I've seen people who lose the art of fighting back. After some time, just give up. The thief cannot bear the fact that he possesses any kind of blessing. Therefore, if he is unsuccessful at stealing the good things from your life, he will try to cunningly convince you to give up everything you possess and love. Simply because he doesn't want you to have it. He might even try to create stressful situations that cause you to conclude that your only solution is a sacrifice. Have you been there? You'll create compartments. And then Jesus said he'll come to destroy. The word is apollomi in Greek, which means he comes with the idea, something that is ruined, waste, trash, devastated, and destroyed. So if you paraphrase, he comes to, you know, artfully take things out of you, make you give up things in life, including dreams, and finally you ruin, devastate your life. And what touched my heart? That's something that I heard in my spirit. The Lord told me, with all this combined business of the enemy, Jesus' answer to all that is one word, life. Life is Jesus' antidote to thievery, to murder, to destruction, every plan of the enemy. And Jesus said, I'm not just giving you life, but life in abundance. It is not just supernatural life, but the word is periso, which I've used in the past. The word means it, go, it is not just normal, but retain a vitality, gusto, vigor, and zest. Something that makes you live abundant life. He didn't say just life. That word life itself is supernatural. But he said abundant life. Meaning supernatural and on top of that, it will be beyond what you can even dream of. Now let me make a statement here. When the enemy comes with all his tools, you go with the life. Abundant life of Jesus. Now let me give you one second if you believe the answer to every attack of the enemy is a life of Jesus. Can you make a statement of joy in the house of life? Life in abundance. Let my people have life. Let me say this. I, I couldn't preach on it. That's why I read it out. I just got a one minute audio from somebody yesterday. I don't even know this person. But I thought it was fascinating. If God speaks a word, believe it. It'll come to pass. There's a, from a person that I've not seen. I don't even know this person. But this is what the person said to me from the United States yesterday night. Can you play that? Just one minute. Pastor Anison, hi, my name is Sandy. I think about 20 years ago, you prophesied over me. Um, and at that time, I was a young 15-year-old girl, um, severely troubled, lonely, depressed. And I remember you prophesied and said, I would one day have this amazing life where I would be educated, respected, and just become a pillar of my community. At 15, I thought that was a complete lie. Now I am 37 years old. I have a Juris Doctorate, and I'm probably the most educated person in the family. I just wanted to reach out and say how much your prophecy changed my life. Even though at that time I didn't believe it, I always referred back to it. That maybe there were some truths to what that man was saying. So I just wanted to reach out today and say thank you. Fifteen years. 
depressed, lonely, rejected, had no hope. One prophetic word, you will have great education, respected in your family, and it'll become the pillar of your community. That, those words look like a lie, but at the age of 37, all those words have come to fulfillment, including a doctorate. Let me tell you, can you believe God's word as life? In spite of what you're going through, is anybody that believes if God speaks a word, it'll bring life into every situation of my life or abundant life? Only people who believe in the abundant life that Jesus offers, put your hands together, give a Lord a praise. Come on. Just abundant life. Abundant life. Life that nobody can take from you. That's God's answer to the devil's attack. Let me close here. This is God's message for the next season. Keep going. Take positions. Keep speaking the words of truth. Even in the temple. Don't hide. Don't try to preserve your own life. But what I found interesting, let me just read and pray and close. Just read. Verse 21 onwards. Can somebody, because there's also a message of responsive manner in this place. Anybody wants to stand with me for the next five minutes as I conclude? No compulsion. Anybody wants to stand with me? Sister, come to the front. Come. Yes? Stand with Jareen here. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak. You know what a powerful word it is. They didn't even wait for another day. Next day, early morning, they went to the temple. If God says, that's it. Make a thorough introspection of your heart. After God did something to me special, did I take matters into my own hands and did what I wanted to do? Or I let God decide my future. So they did all this, keep next to us. When the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, keep reading. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. That's all the apostles. Then the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words. They were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. Now someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, and saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than church. Every major move of God will bottle down to this one little truth. Man or God. We must obey God. It's compulsion. It's not choice. And not man. I sense a mighty evangelistic anointing on you, sister. On you. Come on. Yes, on. you, you. Just lift up your hand. You're going to lead people to the Lord. This has been a cry of your heart for some time. And you're going to see it happen very soon. They'll come to your house to seek prayer from you. Even though things 
looks so ordinary in your own house, God is going to use you to touch others. Even the fact that you could come to the worship place, God gave you favor. Otherwise, it would have been difficult. The voice of discontent is rising from your own family. But God says things are going to turn around. I'll make your house a place where people are going to come and receive Jesus. Because you carry the words of life. Yes. Amen. It will come down to that. In the previous chapter, all that Peter did, he looked at them. He didn't talk about the miracles. No, don't focus on miracles and signs. Don't focus on that. That's God's business. You focus on this one thing. Who will I obey? Everything else is incidental. It will happen. You can't manufacture it. Who should I obey? And the Lord told me something today. When you do that, what happens? Keep, even the previous chapter, Peter says, who should I listen to? To you or to God? It will come down to that. Can you read the next verse? The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. You know, he didn't speak about the miracle angel coming. Keep your message clear. When you get a chance, only lift up Jesus. More than talking about the, your miracle, talk about Jesus. Lift him up. The people killed him by hanging him on a tree next to us. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Next word. And we are witness to these things. So is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit has a certain proximity to people who obey God. You want more of the Holy Spirit? This is a key. But what I want you to know, church, I like the word witness. You know what that means? Son, come here. I don't think I've ever called you. Come. Be a carrier of the word of life. How old are you? 16. Nathan's age. I think hairstyle also looks like Nathan. <laughs> this hairstyle is going around so much. Sometimes I go to a place and say, that's Nathan. Everybody looks like Nathan. This is a common thing. Son, I want you to know why I called you because you represent the next generation. All you have to say is, God gave me the grace to obey you. That's all what matters. You know what happens? From that moment onwards, the Holy Spirit will become your co-witness. You know what that means? When you say this is true, the Holy Spirit will come and say, I take the place of a co-witness. And I will prove it is true. Let's say you said Jesus is a healer. And the Holy Spirit says, now leave it to me. With signs and wonders. I am going to prove. I will be your co-witness. Wherever you go, I will go with you. Whenever you open your mouth, I will be the witness. You want to see signs, wonders, and miracles happen? You obey God. Put God above man. And the Holy Spirit will become your partner. Your companion. Anybody wants that today? Anybody wants the Holy Spirit to be a co-witness? The next two minutes, if you want to walk out of your seats, do it, please. Just two minutes. Where the witnessing will not be your 
your strength or your responsibility alone. You witness, you just obey God and the Holy Spirit will become your co-witness. How many of you want to say, Tysa, this could be a very major message for your future? Drawing the line kind of a message. You are called with a special call. Is that your mother? Huh? Your friend, who's that? Oh, okay. God has called some people with a special call. He gave you extraordinary visitation and miracle. For one reason, go, stand, speak. You say, God, how can I do it? One key word. When God says something, obey. And the Holy Spirit will become your co-witness. Anybody wants to come down from there? You can move down as well. Because today is a day that we honor the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. Pray. Anybody wants to step forward, you can step forward. Honor the Holy Spirit. There's no way you can bring the Holy Spirit by clapping hands or create. That's not the way he works. He is attracted to people who will become kind of stupid in a way for the things of God. The best way was to go not into temple. But God says, go into the temple. That's a place where you avoid. But God says, don't avoid. And the Bible says they started to speak in the temple day and night. And the ministry started to grow. If you have gone away from the original plan of God, come back. Because when you do that, all things will be added. Things that you never imagined will be given to you. Pastor Netram, you're a senior pastor. So I'm honoring your pastoral background. But both of you, can you also come forward? Because God has a new beginning for your life in terms of ministry. Let's pray. Anybody wants to step forward and say, God, you have given me unique interventions in order for a great purpose. There was a pull to take you back to the place that you came from. But in spite of seeing many things lost, you held on to my word. There was such pressure for you to leave everything behind and go and escape. You almost came to that point. You almost made decisions. But somewhere in your heart, you said, God, I don't want to go outside your plan. This season has come for God to honor you. The days of honor is here. <laughs> come on, people, pray. Shanta. Come on. Come. Young boys, if you want to come forward, come, Caleb, or oh, come, come forward. Young boys, just come to the front. Yes, my son is, I think, is with the online recording. Come, son, let's pray. There will be a generation that will go, stand, they'll take positions. They will not be moving with what the culture says what the people say they will have their eyes fixed on Jesus and they will speak the words of life and while they are speaking the Holy Spirit will bring life I believe cancers will be healed people will be set free 
because there is nobody who has the words of life like Jesus has. And you are going to be given the task of taking those words to people that you never saw before. Do you want to be a person who will carry the words of Jesus? Come on, hallelujah. The thief has come to kill, to destroy, and to steal. But Jesus came to give life, and life in abundance. Can you receive it in the name of the Lord? Father, for the next season of our church, which is going to be even more glorious, where people will go to many places with the words of life, not just going, Lord, on the buses, <laughs> in cafeterias, the gospel will spread. People are going to be transformed and saved. An anointing of evangelism is coming over your people. But today we are going with this assurance that we are carrying something that no religion can offer. The words of life. Anoint your people, Lord. Lord, for the next season of my life, by your grace I declare, I want to please you more, more than any human being. I want to obey you, God. Lord, what I need from you is a companionship of your Holy Spirit. That's all what I need, who will be a co-witness. Thank you, Lord, it's been done. But as your servant today, I speak against every bondage that has come upon family. I am now eliminating, evacuating the thief that entered people's lives. Thank you, Lord, it's been done. By the life of Jesus, I want those thieves, those the demonic powers to leave families right now. We thank you it's been done. It's been done. We thank you it's been done. In Jesus' precious name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Can you give God a mighty... Come on church. Give him some praise in the house. A minister.